Welcome to the reading of the book, Signpost on the Road to Success by E.W. Kenyon. My spirit goes with thee, little book of my dreams. Go waken the slumberer, go strengthen the weak, encourage the disheartened. To the lone dreamer speak, yes, kindle within him a mighty desire, with dauntless ambition, set his spirit on fire. Keep at it. How did you ever do it? I can't see how anyone could do a thing like that. We were in a curio shop. On the table there was a whole army of little figures that had been whittled out by hand. What hours of work must have been spent on them. This friend of mine stood there and looking at them said, How did you ever do it? The man smiled and said, I just kept at it. I went out of the door, I walked the street, and I heard those three words, Kept at it, kept at it, kept at it. How they rang through my soul. That man had kept at it. He had put life into it. He had made a success. People were coming from all parts of the country to see the effect of that cultivated, trained genius. All the man had done was to train his mind and hand and then whittle his dreams out of wood, of soft stone and ivory. I was thrilled through and through at the possibilities that were wrapped up in common folk like you and me. I heard a girl play the piano. She was not over 16. I knew something about music. We had a music department in our institution for many years. I looked into her face, and I whispered in my own heart, Girl, you have spent hours pounding the keys while other girls were walking the street. While others were sleeping and mother was trying to get them out of bed, you were pounding those keys. You have lost a heap of good times, but what a musician you are. She kept at it. That is why she won. I stood with a man overlooking a beautiful farm in northern Maine. I said to him, who cleared this land? Who stumped it? He answered, Do you see that little log house down there by the creek? I built that, and wife and I moved into it before there was an acre of this land cleared. I vowed that I would clear every acre of it and put it into crops, and I have done it. That is the spirit that conquers. I vowed I would do it, and I have done it. I stood by the loom in the factory as a boy and vowed that I would become an educator. I did not know what it meant, but I knew that within me was a teaching gift, an undeveloped thing. I vowed I would do it. I did it. I was handicapped, as few men have been handicapped. But I did it. I am passing it on to you to show that they cannot conquer you if you will to do it. Struggle to improve. In every effort, improve the dream. Every time you play that piece on the piano, play it better than you played it before. Every time you sit down to that typewriter, make up your mind that you're going to be more efficient than you have ever been. Make your brain work. It will sweat, but make it work. It will improve. It will develop until you become a wonder to those around you. Don't depend on an alarm clock. Don't depend on mothers waking you. Make up your mind that you will have the alarm clock in your soul. Never depend on another man's car. Get one of your own. Be self-reliant. Be punctual. Be diligent. Think through on every problem. Conquer your difficulties as a part of the day's job. We are out in the fight, and we will win the crown. Chapter 2. What have you in yourself? It is what you are, what you have in you that counts. It is the undeveloped resources in your mind, in your spirit, in that inward man that counts. It is the developing of the writer, the thinker, the teacher, the inventor, the leader, the business manager that is hidden deep in you that is important. I venture that every one of you young men and women who read this have in you one of these abilities. There may be an untrained voice, untrained musical abilities lying hidden under the careless, thoughtless exterior. Let us go down with a flashlight and look over the untouched treasures that are stored away inside that have never been touched, never been used. Then let us bring the thing up that we find and make it worthwhile, give it a commercial value. For remember that everything that goes toward making you a success is inside of you. The thing that makes opportunities, that makes money, that saves money, that creates new things, that brings together things that others have created but were unable to utilize, is inside of you. Find it and make it work. It is going to require a boss who is utterly heartless to rule over you. The boss is inside of you. There is a slave driver in there whom you must bring out. Put the whip in his hand and tell him to go to it and make you a success. There is something in you that can take these dreams of yours and make blueprints of them 
and then can change the blueprints into buildings. It is there. That ability is there. No one else can train it. No one else can develop it. Someone else may set it on fire, but you can quench the fire by refusing to act. Remember that you must use the suggestions that come. You must rise up and put the thing over. You must drive yourself, for no one else can do it. Put yourself on a mental diet. Not a diet of idle dreams nor idle fancies, but a diet of real mental work. Be mentally awake, diligent. Put your best into every day. Make up your day of saved moments, hours. You are out to win. You are out to conquer. You can do it. It would be different if this ability were in someone else and you were trying to awaken it. It is all in you, and you are going to put it over. Chapter 3. Using what is in you. There is a gold mine hidden in every life. Nature never made a failure. Every man has success hidden away in his soul. No one else can find it but himself. He holds the key to the hidden room. Failure comes because we never sought that hidden treasure. Failure comes because we tried to find it somewhere else. You can't find it anywhere else. Success, victory, achievement are in you. The exceptional people are those who develop what is within them. That quartet is winning fame and success because they developed what they had in them. Singly, they could not do it, but united, they make a harmony that thrills the heart. The soloist had it in her. It was there, and she developed it and made it of commercial value. I have seen three great baritones. One was a miner, who, had he not been too lazy and loved the companionship of drinking men and useless women, would have been known the world over. What a voice he had. I picked him up, a drunkard. I tried to make a man of him. I bought him clothes when it was known that Scotty was going to sing, the building could not hold the crowd. I said to him, I don't know whether my pianist can play the pieces that you want to sing without looking them over. He looked at me with a peculiar expression and said, I need no accompaniment. He stood by the piano that first night in his old mining clothes and sang. I closed my eyes and I couldn't locate him because his voice utterly filled that whole room. He seemed to be everywhere in it. That great voice was strange, sweet, wonderful music. He made the songs all over that he sang that night. I raised the money and sent him back to his own land. He promised to sing again. As a boy, he sang in Drury, but he confessed he was so drunk it took a man to hold him up. But he never amounted to anything. He did not develop the thing that was in him. Genius has grown up to weeds about it just because they did not develop the thing they had. I know it is hard work, but you will learn to love hard work. There are no great gold nuggets lying on top of the earth now. You have to go down into the earth for them. You must dig for them. You want the applause of the world. You want money to buy fine clothes and build splendid houses. Awaken, young men. Go find that hidden place in your own nature. Dig and dig until you have conquered. A father was dying. He had two sons. The boys always felt that he had gold that he had hidden away somewhere. He had never been a strong, healthy man, so his farm was not developed. Back of the house, there was ten acres of stump land. When he was dying, he said, The stump lot. Again and again, he said, The stump lot. As soon as the funeral was over, the boys said, The gold is out in the stump lot. How feverishly they worked. They tore up every inch of it, but they found no gold. Then the older one said, we have the land in good condition. Let's put in corn. In the autumn, they found in the ripened corn the gold. You have a stump lot in you. Dig it up, clean it up, and you will find the gold in it. Chapter 4. Train Yourself What you do for yourself counts far more than all that others have done or can do for you. Self-discipline is the most important feature in any life. Unless you put yourself under mental discipline, you will never develop the forces in you that are valuable to the commercial world. Rule your temper so that no matter what happens, what is said or done, your temper will be under absolute control. The man who does not rule his temper can never achieve the success that belongs to him. He destroys the building that he erects. Govern your tongue so that it will say nothing that will injure anyone around you. Practically all the injury that is done to a character, to a business, a home, or a person is done with words. It is a tongue work. The man or woman who makes no contribution to destructive thought and talk is a valuable asset anywhere. He is deaf to anything that is destructive to another. He is blind to anything that folks around him do. He cannot speak of it. 
he has mastery of himself. The efficiency of an office force is reduced sometimes 50% by idle, unkind words. The man who can govern his temper, his tongue, and his appetite, though he has but mediocre ability, is bound to get to the top. Gaining the mastery of these will be among your first real victories. It is controlled power that is valuable. That waterfall is simply beautiful. It has no commercial value until it is harnessed. It is the harnessed ability in you that is worthwhile. Ability under intelligent mastery. Find out what you wish to be or do, then train yourself for it. What you have undeveloped in you has no value. No one else either wishes or has the time to develop it. That is your business. The training is all done by you. If you have a voice, put yourself under a teacher, then work and carry out the teacher's instructions. If it is art, put yourself under a competent instructor and obey the laws of art and work. Nothing will take the place of hard work, intelligently directed. Talents in you need push and determination to make them worth money. It is you and you alone who will do the developing. The lazy person who waits for something to turn up is a failure. The only things that will turn up are rent and bills. Nothing will take the place of self-denial and hard work. It is easy to become a failure. All you need to do is to idly dream. It is the man who wills and keeps on willing who wins. Don't float. Don't wait for an opportunity. Go make your opportunity. Put your whole self into life. Study. Drive yourself. Always remember that your worst enemy is inside of you. No circumstances, no person or combination of persons can conquer you as long as you do not destroy your own prospects yourself. Don't be satisfied with anything you do. Always seek to improve yourself. Chapter 5. What are you worth? What value do you place on yourself? Have you ever taken an inventory or have you just said, well, I know I could do it if I would. I believe I can sing better than that person who is singing now. Or I believe I could build a business. Or I could be this. Or I could be that. Are you going to be what you could be? Honestly, are you worth anything in your own estimation? Have you set a price on yourself? Have you set a price on your own ability, on your own time? What is your word worth to yourself? When you say, I will get that lesson, I will conquer that subject, I will master that problem, is your word worth anything? Do you make your word come true when you say, I will give that up, I will put that thing over? What is that word worth to you? Have you faith in your own word? I'm not asking what your word is worth outside. Pride may make you keep your word with people, but do you keep your word with yourself? You are too valuable to barter away the finest part of manhood or womanhood, your word. You are worth more to yourself, likely, than to anyone else. But by a year from now, can you make yourself so valuable that men will pay any price for you? Great corporations are looking for men and women who can earn $50,000 a year. Set your mark, your standard high, then go up there. Allow no day to go by in which you have not improved yourself. Take an inventory again and again and see what you possess. See whether that possession is more valuable today than it was a year ago. Find where your ability lies. Then put all of your best into that ability and make that ability come across and put you over. Remember that what you have hungered and yearned to do, you have the ability to do, if you will. Chapter 6 Why are you a spiritual failure? Modern preaching has produced the modern spiritual failure that we see in the church. Failures are not ready-made. They are the product of the teaching that we have had or the absence of the right teaching. I am convinced that most people will come to the level of the Father's purpose if they know how. The spiritual failure I am talking about is one who is born of God, but who has never developed, who has remained in an infant state through many years because of malnutrition. They feed upon theories of men rather than upon the Word of God. They have lived in the realm of sense knowledge rather than in the realm of the Word of God. They are ever praying for faith, not realizing that all things belong to them, that He has blessed them with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ, and that at the very beginning God marked us out for the position of sons and daughters through Jesus Christ unto Himself. Ephesians 1, 3 and 4. You see, the purpose of the Father was healthy, vigorous children. Can you conceive of an intelligent, earthly parent that wishes to give birth to children that will be sickly, half-witted, deformed creatures? Why, the thing doesn't sound reasonable. 
And do you think the Heavenly Father takes pleasure in having us sick, mentally, physically, and spiritually? Do you think Jesus likes to contemplate the number of Christians that are in hospitals undergoing hideous operations and going through the torture of the damned? Chapter 7 All Have Ability I did not believe this once. I thought there were but a few who had real ability and that the rest of us belonged to the mob. I venture to say that it will be almost impossible to pick out a single person in any large establishment who does not have the ability along some line that could make him outstanding if it were developed. I am dictating this little article for the ambitious man or woman, not for the man who is too lazy to develop what is in him, but for the man who is unsatisfied with anything but the best. As I study men and women, I am convinced of this. There are very few who have developed to the limit the possibilities within them. There is no overdevelopment. Many people are in the wrong place in life. They have no gift for the thing they are trying to do. They are doing it simply to get by. There is room and a salary waiting for the man who has ability and is willing to put hard work into it. Choose your work rather than have the work in which you have no interest thrust upon you. Find out what you can do, what you like best to do. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your handicaps are. They have never made a handicap that could hold any man down who had in him the yeast to rise. Most of the people who are at the bottom are at the bottom because they will stay there. That is where they belong. It is a hard thing to say, but it is true. I am now what I will to be through all these years. The first thing to do is to find out what you want. Set your eyes on the goal, then fight for it. There must be an objective. When you find that objective, set your compass and sail for that star. Chapter 8 Putting Yourself in the Way of Success If only I could repeat it over and over again, so that wherever you turned in this book, your eyes would see this one fact. You have within you all of the qualities and elements that are necessary to make you a success. Your chief work is the development of the thing that nature has already given you. Before you go to the office, create all around you and in you an atmosphere of victory. You go out with the consciousness that you have victory. You and the unseen one are going down to the office together, and you're going to put it over. You are going out after that job with the smile of a victor, not the smile of a man who is trying to smile, but the man who smiles in spite of himself. Cultivate the habit of thorough work. If it is mental work, think every problem through. Be the one man in that office where you work who thinks through on every problem that comes up. You will find that the boss will want you. Very few men have the ability to think through. They guess, they speculate, they theorize. But down yonder behind the desk is the man who takes the problem and resolutely drives himself to think through that problem from every angle. The boss can get men to do what he tells them to do. He is looking for one with the ability to tell the others how to do it. So set the standard high for yourself. Have a lofty spiritual ideal. Climb to it. Between you and it, there may be many a swamp through which a road must be made. Lumbermen always build roads to the timber they wish to market. You will have to build a road to market your abilities. There is pain and fatigue ahead for you, but you dress for the job. Remember to associate with people who have won, those who help you climb to the top. Don't hang around with a group of has-beens. Associate with the men who are climbing up. The idle gossiping people will not help you. The lazy and careless will stand in your way. Those who spend their nights in the roadhouse or at the gambling hall will never help you. Don't think you can get something for nothing. Put your money where it will count. Put your time where it will pay you dividends. This battle is not for the thoughtless, heedless guesser or idealistic dreamer. It is for the man who works. Chapter 9 The Happy Spirit The glad smile from an honest heart is better than a sermon. A smiling salesman has the deal half made. You can sell more easily with a gracious smile than you can with a dead, unresponsive countenance. Mothers who start the day with kindness and smiles and tender words have happier homes. The fathers who try it will make the breakfast a glad half hour. It is the key that unlocks so many hearts. We wish to remember the glad face, the happy smile, the joyful words. We want to forget the other kind. Tones are better when we smile. The voice is richer when smiles are blended in it. A smiling clerk, a smiling salesman is the one who attracts us.
Chapter 10. How We Win Reason makes the plans. The strong one carries them through. The strong one is your will. Dream, then carry out your dreams. Drive yourself to the finish line. The willless dreamer is never a success. You have the vision. Make it come to pass. You dream your dream, and then make the dream come true. Cultivate a discontent with everything that is common in yourself. Compel yourself to improve your mind, your natural abilities. If you have the gift of cooking, be the best cook in the community. If you have a gift, no matter what it is, make that gift stand out until men will admire it. Then someone will want to pay the price for it. A young man had an unusual gift for dressing windows. He had worked in a store for a long time. He had watched the window dresser and given him suggestions. Until, by and by, the window dresser asked that he might become his helper. It was but a few weeks until the helper became the artist. The head dresser never told the boss who did the artwork, but men came from different parts of the city to look at the windows. There was always a crowd in front of the store. One day a man came from a distance. He asked who dressed the window. The manager introduced him to the head dresser. The man was disappointed. He said he does not talk like one who could do this kind of work. The young man had stood by. Later he was introduced. The man said, Do you dress these windows? The young fellow said, I am only the sidekick. I have this amount of space in my window. The other said, What would you do with it? The young man said, If you will come back this afternoon, I will tell you. He went into his office and drew the plans. When the man came back and looked at it, he said, I will give you $2,500 a year if you'll go back with me. He had been working for $15 a week. You cannot hide trained genius. You cannot hide trained ability. Other people may use you for a time, but you will break the bond sooner or later, like the young man did. It is in you. Pull it out. Chapter 11. It is the you in you that wins. Paul speaks of the hidden man of the heart. That is the you that is in you. The visible you is not the you that puts you over. It is the unseen you who wins the fight. The seen you may be very attractive or very repellent. It is the unseen you with whom we really wish to become acquainted. It is the unseen you, this hidden man of the heart who runs the whole machinery, who is the boss of the institution. He is the man who is to build you into success. He is the fellow who raises the money to put you over. He is the one who made the seen you come across and make good. It is this unseen you to whom I am writing this morning. I am trying to reach him and cause him to make the seen you study, work, and make yourself worthwhile in life's game. It is the unseen you who makes the seen you worthwhile and makes you do things that have commercial value, who makes you do things that the world is waiting to have done. I am saying to the unseen you, get behind this seen you. Make him work. Make him study. Make him dig until he has won the fight. Chapter 12. What's the use? God has forgotten me and nobody cares. I might as well throw up the sponge. These words were said to me just a few weeks ago by a young woman. I asked her how she knew that God had forgotten her and how she knew that nobody believed in her. She said, I have had nothing but failure ever since I came to the city. I said, don't you think we should take an inventory and find out why you have had failure? What is the reason for it? When a person has a string of bad luck, I feel like diagnosing the case and if possible, finding what is wrong. Well, she said, I was whipped when I came. This was the frontier of last resort to me. I was simply running away from bad luck in the East. I said, you didn't expect to win, did you? I had hoped I might. I thought if I could get in the right surroundings, I might get on top. But I noticed a hopeless strain in her voice and a look of hopelessness in her eyes. I said, let's go back to the beginning of things for a bit. You know that God cannot fail anyone who trusts Him. Suppose you bring Him your shattered, broken present. Then make a new start today. He will wipe out all the past, and as he wipes it out, you begin now as though you had never tried and failed. She said, Oh, I would give anything if I could do that. But you can do it. All those who have reached the top have had to do it. Many of the dreams and expectations of youth have been lost. But there have been born new dreams and new expectations. The faith of youth and young manhood and womanhood has been destroyed and a new faith has been born out of the failures of the past. I can see her now. If I could only do that, if there could only be born in my heart a new faith, a new dream. I said your worst enemy is your memory. 
Your worst trait is going back over the failures and taunting yourself. You cry nearly every night after you go to bed because you have failed. She said, yes, that's true. But, I said, you are done with that. You are done with all that is past. Failure is a memory thing to be forgotten. Right now, we are writing on a new page, a new history. You have a new name. The name is Victory. We will call it Victoria. We will christen this new girl with a new name, and you will go out to win. You can succeed. Life is big and rich ahead of you. Let him, the unseen one, take care of you. She whispered softly. Do you think he would do it? I know he would. He counts it a privilege. He is looking for opportunities like this. I imagine he has had his eye on you for a long time, waiting for you to look up through the clouds and ask for his help. She went out to win. I met her days afterwards. She had no past. She had nothing but a brilliant, glad future ahead of her. She said, you know, it was so easy to get a job. I went into the same store where they had turned me down, and they seemed to be glad I came. I am doing the work I enjoy. Those of you who are chasing after a better job have in you the possibilities of a better job. Don't spoil them. Sell yourself to the man who needs you. It is easy to do it when you have the right mental attitude towards life. Chapter 13 Loose Talking Keeler speaking is a vicious habit. When one realizes that his words are the coin of his kingdom and that his words can be a cursing influence or a blessing, he will learn to value the gift of speech. Control your tongue, or it will control you. You will often hear men say, I speak my mind. That is well if you have a good mind, but if your mind is poisoned, it is not good. An idle word spoken may fall into the soil of someone's heart and poison his whole life. What a blessing good conversation is, and what a curse its opposite. Make your tongue a blessing, never a curse. A person is judged by his speech. Your words make you a blessing or a curse. Your words may carry a fortune in them. Learn to be master of your conversation. Chapter 14. Handicaps. There are few who have reached the top who have not been handicapped. Obstacles stand in the way of the man who climbs. I don't know why this is, but I know it is true. These obstacles have to be overcome. But in the overcoming, one fits himself for places of responsibility. I thank God for poverty, for need of self-denial, for self-culture, for long hours of study and hard work. The inward drive to plod on when tired is the thing which makes men strong, self-reliant conquerors. Every failure stimulates them to harder work. There is no giving up. There is no yielding. Facing impossible circumstances becomes a daily experience to the conqueror. He learns to win. He has cultivated the will to win, the will to conquer. He kept the fires of ambition burning. He has made work a part of himself. He has a group of very fine habits. He has the habit of study, the habit of control of his eyes and ears, the control of his passions and ambitions. He is master. He is the man who uses the public library and second-hand bookstores. He is ever studying to improve himself in his place. He knows his trade, his business, his profession. He makes himself an authority in his particular field. He counts his handicaps a blessing. He goes on with God and wins. No man is a failure until he lies down and the undertaker puts him under the sod. Chapter 15. The Wrong Slant it is no use. I might as well give it up. Every time I try, I only fail. Every job I get, I lose. Every dollar I get ahead, something happens, and I have to use it. I am no farther ahead now than I was ten years ago. There is something dead wrong somewhere. I said to him, friend, what has been the difficulty? I don't know. I said, I will tell you what your trouble is the way it appears to me. You have the wrong slant on life. You have talked about your failing, your difficulties, until they have become a mental disease. I venture to say that the last man of whom you sought to find employment read you like a book and said, I don't want that man in my crew. He's a chronic fault finder. You have had so much trouble that you have eaten it, slept with it, dreamed it, until it oozes out of you. He said, I know it, but how can I overcome it? It is the easiest thing in the world to overcome. Solomon's solution was to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not upon thine own understanding. In other words, go into partnership with God where you cannot fail. But that is religion. There is no religion about this. You are dead wrong. Religion is a man-made thing. This is a God-made thing. 
This is common sense to link up with God. You take Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you confess Him as your Lord. The moment you do, you receive God's life and ability, and you cannot fail. If you will walk with Him, you can no more fail than Jesus failed. But Jesus failed on the cross, didn't He? Yes, but it was the greatest victory which came out of that failure that has ever been known. That was divine strategy. He will make you a conqueror if you walk with Him. Chapter 16 Facing Life As It Is Don't say, if things were different, I would do something. Do something with them as they are. Facing your life as it is now and winning is the object. When things go hard and money stops coming in, or you lose your job and everything goes wrong, take account of stock, see what is wrong, see what you have forgotten, and go on and conquer. We dream what we would do if... Now wipe out the if, dream, and do it regardless of circumstances. You say, that cannot be done. It can be done. There is no can't about it. The man who wills to do it, who puts up the fight and is willing to do the work, can put it over. A young man discovered a vein of gold high up in the mountain. He needed power. He needed money. He needed to know how to develop it. He struggled and worked and failed. Sitting down one night, after a long, hard day, tired, clear through and through, he said to himself, I know where my difficulty is. I don't know anything about this rock. I don't know anything about geology, and I know nothing about mining. I am going down to the city and find out. He came down to the city and went to the head of the mining department in the university and laid the case before him. The professor called up a mining engineer. He met the young man. The young man told his story. The engineer said that he must go and see the vein. It took about a week to get there. After the engineer had seen it, he said, There are millions there, but it will cost a great deal to get in here and to develop it. You will have to organize a stock company or sell it. Which will you do? The young man said, I am going to develop it. It took him a year of hard training and study. He gave himself utterly to it. Through the long winter months, he drove himself until when the springtime came, he had acquired the knowledge that he needed. It made him millions. The trouble with too many people is that they want to get it too easily. Most of us say, if I had had a chance, but circumstances were against me. I don't have an education. I didn't have the pull. We lay our failure to the lack of opportunity. The other fellow, handicapped, worse than we, made opportunities. He fought until opportunities came to him. Success belongs to the man who simply wills to do it. He is the man who makes success come his way. The fellow who lies down and says, I can't do it, is a failure. Never lose heart, because the first efforts fail. Go back and find the reason. Pick up the wreckage of old failures and build them into success. You can do it. Chapter 17. Just a word of warning. Children's lives are largely made up of words the words of their parents and those whom they love and admire. A mother can fill her boy's heart with zeal for an education and for a position in life, or she can with words destroy the finest spirit that was ever given to a home. The children are word made. What do I mean? Their lives are made up of words of their parents and loved ones. The wife little appreciates the power of words on her husband's life. When he loses his job, she could scold him and tell him that he is no good. He was whipped before he came home, but he would then be doubly whipped. Instead, she puts her arms around him and says, That's all right, dear. You'll get a better position. You are worthy of a better job anyway. He goes out the next morning, thrilled by the touch of her lips, and her words have filled him with courage and confidence. He leaves her heart filled with joy and gladness, and she says, What a man God gave me. He says, What a woman you gave me, Lord. They have learned the secret of words. A few devastating words could have filled his mind with confusion, his heart with pain, and his eyes with tears. Words give heartache, and words give strength and comfort and faith. Let's be careful of the words we use. Don't tell that story you heard the other day about this man or that woman. Don't let any other ears be poisoned as your ears have been poisoned with it. Never repeat scandal. Never repeat the calamity things. Let others do the talking about that. You keep your lips for beautiful things, helpful things, 
comforting things. That is your job. Chapter 18. The Mental Hitchhiker. Are the fish worth the cost of pole, line, and hooks? Is honor and competence in old age worth saving, self-denial, and hard work in youth? Would it not be better to spend your money and squander your time knowing that when old age comes, there'll be a pension of 15 or $20 a month? These are suggestions that face earnest young people today. You can spend your time in the roadhouse, in the shows or dances, or idly roaming the streets, or you can drive yourself to study and fit yourself for the place that is waiting. Everywhere, big business is hunting for competent help. Many mediocre men fill places of importance because no one can be found who is really fitted for the job. It is surprising how difficult it is to find even a good stenographer, to find someone who can take charge of a department and make it a success, to find someone who will take a vital interest in the work and put it over. Almost every man and woman is a time server. His ambition is to get his wages with as little work as possible. The new mental attitude is to get without giving. You cannot be a success and do that. The good old days of honest labor seem to be but a dream today. The road that leads to a good bank account is an uphill road, and most of us have to build the road ourselves. The hitchhikers are filling the road today. They want someone else's car to ride in. They want someone to buy the gas. They want someone to pay the taxes and give them free passage. Are you a mental hitchhiker? Are you a mental hobo? Or are you one of the fellows who pay the taxes, build the roads, and bear the burdens? If you are a success, you will have to bear the burdens. You will have to pay the taxes for a hundred other people. The easy way is to hobo it. It is the way of least resistance. I believe a fellow can get used to going on short rations, wearing old clothes, and sleeping in the jungle. But as for me, I am going to go to the top. I am sending out this invitation for the rest of you to come with me. Chapter 19. Loyalty. Everyone who employs help places loyalty above almost any other trait in his help. We need skilled mechanics. We need skilled workmen in every department. Regardless of their skill, if they are disloyal, they hinder production. They hinder efficiency. They hinder the growth of the business. The new class consciousness that has been developed in the last few years along political lines has been of great injury to our nation. What we need is old-fashioned loyalty to the man or the company for whom we are working. The spirit of loyalty gives a sense of security to the firm. It is a guarantee of a higher grade production, of a higher quality of the thing produced. It guarantees permanency and safety in investment. No one has a right to draw a salary from a firm if he will not be loyal to the firm. If one cannot be loyal, he should find another position. The first thing that we expect in a man after efficiency in his trade is loyalty to the company. It should be taught in our schools and in our homes that we are not rendering to the firm or company our best until we give our hearts loyalty in our service. Chapter 20. What are you going to do? What of life? You are standing on the threshold. Before you lie the untried paths. What are you going to do? Have you chosen your work, your vocation, your place in life, or are you drifting hoping that something will turn up. It will, but the thing that turns up will be of no value to you unless you are ready to take it as it comes. Don't float. Dead fish float. Make up your mind that you will put your dreams into blueprints, and then, with that blueprint in hand, you will build your mansion. Find your place, but be sure that you do thorough preparatory work. Put real hard work into the days of preparation. Don't just get by. Don't be satisfied with anything but 100 plus. Fight for it. Work for it. Enjoy it. Make it a game to win. Be a success in youth, and you will be a success in middle life. You'll be crowned in old age. Make yourself a wanted person. Be so valuable that if you had to move, men and women would weep because of your departure. If you plan to be a minister, be God's best. If you go into business, be the best in your community. If you plan to be a lawyer or a physician, Put a trained, cultured personality into it. Whatever you do, plan to build your house on top of the hill. Harness that lazy mind and make it work. That mind can make a place for you. Let me say again to you, go under your own steam. Prepare yourself, and doors will open to you everywhere. Chapter 21. The Bell Ringer. You are selling from house to house. You are ringing bells. 
That is a good place to start life. I started it there. You meet a different person every five minutes. If you can get them to listen to you, that is the first step. So many simply say, I haven't time, and slam the door in your face. You smile and go to the next. That's the game. But the man who can get inside the house to display his goods is the man who puts it over. The first requisite is a smile and a glad good morning. It is not an ingratiating smile, but a wholesome, big, warm smile. You know that you have something that they need, something they ought to have. You come there with the heart of a philanthropist. You have something to give. They are going to get something worth more than they pay for it. You are not trying to outdo them, but you are there to give them something worthwhile. I didn't know anything about the sales game when I went into it as a boy of 21. Salesmanship was not taught then as it is today. I became one of the pioneers of sales talk, teaching the art of salesmanship. But I found that I could not sell unless I had confidence in the thing I was selling. I was selling pianos and organs from house to house. I tried to sell an instrument in which I had no confidence. I was an utter failure. I went back to the office and asked the manager which was the best piano for such a price. He told me, I went to the factory to find out all about pianos. I wanted to know how the things were built. I went through the factory and studied them until I knew everything a young fellow could learn about the instruments. Then I went out on the road. I knew that I had the best thing on the market for the money. I knew that if I could get a piano into a house and get the boys and girls to practice, it would change the future of that home. I went out to help the community. I succeeded. It was so easy to sell when I had the right mental attitude toward the people. I was trying to bless them. I was trying to help the folk who bought. Do you see the point? That is the real art of salesmanship. I was so dead in earnest about it. I was so enthusiastic about the bargain which I had that I carried them off their feet. I sold to people who had no music in them. I sold to them because of the excessive, burning desire in my heart to make them happy. That is the thing which sells. Settle in your own mind. Is the thing you are selling worthwhile? If it is not, then get something that is. If you are selling insurance, bonds, autos, or groceries, know this. If your entire ambition is simply to get the money out of it, you will fail. But if you are giving them something that is going to be a blessing, and you are enthusiastic over it, you will be a success. Chapter 22 The Chronic Knocker Nothing hurts a firm more than to have in its employ men holding important positions who are chronic knockers, who are always finding fault with the business, with the management, with the material they use. Men of this type should be eliminated. One man of that kind in a church will wreck it. One man of that type and a crew of men in the lumber camp will cause the entire organization to disintegrate. Chronic knockers will spoil an organization and wreck its prospects. Men who talk too much and talk unwisely are a detriment to any organization. Never knock your firm. Never knock the goods you are selling because you are selling yourself in every deal. The man who knocks the firm for which he works knocks himself because he is there. If he is not satisfied with it, he should get out and go somewhere else. We have no right to stir up strife and bitterness while we are drawing a salary from a firm. We have come to an unhappy place. We have been taught politically to hate the people who have been successful in life. That if a man has gained a position of affluence, he must be bad. That is wrong. Men like Henry Ford have climbed to the place they occupy by sheer efficiency and downright honesty. Class hatred is an unfortunate thing. It does not belong in a democracy. It does not belong anywhere. Why should I hate the man who is smarter than I am or who has achieved more than I have? I should honor him and thank God that there are men of that class. Class hatred robs a nation of its efficiency. It robs men of the pleasure and joy of fellowshipping and working with each other. There should be a notice put up in every factory and store and shop saying, no knockers are needed. We need boosters. We need helpers. We need men who encourage, not men who discourage. Make up your mind that whatever you say will be constructive. Just knocking for the sake of knocking is ignorant.